Okay, so today's announcement, same as last time. Um, chapter five sapling is due 9 a.m. on Monday. And then this weekend we have the exam review on Sunday afternoon, 3 to 5 p.m. in Duane G1B20. And the exam is coming up Tuesday, 7 to 9 in Chem 140. Um, so um, that'll cover up through the end of chapter six. I may get a little bit into chapter seven on Monday, but that won't be on the exam. Okay, um, so continuing on with chapter six. Last time what we looked at was absolute configuration, so assigning R and S to stereo centers. We did a few examples of that. Um, what we're gonna look at today is some more examples of three-dimensional geometry and how that affects molecular um, structure. So, What we're looking at today is diastereomers. Um, so the whole idea here is that we saw a couple examples of molecules that have more than one stereocenter, more than one asymmetric carbon. Um, so that's going to be what we're diving into today. So there are multiple possibilities for geometry. Okay, so say we have something with like an OH here, for example, and an OH here. Okay, so I'm not giving you any information yet about boulder dash geometry, but just from looking at it, there's two carbons that jump out as stereocenters because they're carbons that have four different groups coming off of them. So this one here has a methyl, an OH, an H that's not shown, and then the whole rest of the molecule. So that's four different groups. This one here has an OH, this propyl group moving out to the right, um, an H, and also the whole left end of the molecule. So that's a stereocenter there. So we got two different stereocenters. Each of those could be R or S. So we have four possible different structures that this could be. So I'm going to draw the, like, the template structure first. So each OH could be bold or dashed. So I'm going to go through this bold and bold, bold, and dashed, uh, whoops, dashed and bold, or dashed and dashed. So any one of these four, what's called stereoisomers, could be the molecule that I'm drawing over here if I'm being vague as to what the actual geometry is. Okay. So as a rule of thumb, because there's two different possibilities at each stereocenter, um, if you've got a molecule with, say, two stereocenters, you're going to have a total of two to the two possible molecules or possible stereoisomers. So to generalize this, for a molecule with n stereocenters, there are two to the n possible stereoisomers. So if I had three stereocenters, three asymmetric carbons, then I would have eight possible isomers. If I had four, I'd have 16, and so on. Okay, so some of these happen to be mirror images of others. So. So if I draw like a mirror flat in the plane here and I say, okay, let's do bold and bold is the reflection. And then I could have dashed and dashed 
be reflecting into that. So it's like this thing is looking at its reflection in the mirror. Both of its OHs are going away from us, which means that in its reflection, both of the OHs are coming out towards us. And the same for the other pairing, where if I do another mirror over here, if I do say bold and dashed, then that would be the reflection of the dashed bold option. OK, so some of these are mirror images of each other. They're not superimposable. So what's the relationship between these two guys? Based on what we covered earlier in the chapter, they're not, mirror, they're not superimposable, but they are mirror images of each other. And antiomers, exactly. So these two are in antiomers of each other. These two are in antiomers of each other. But what about the other pairings? How do we describe those? Because they're not superimposable, but they're also not mirror images of each other. So like if I'm trying to compare, say, dashed bold with dash dash, um, that's kind of a weirder um, pairing where they're non-superimposable, non-mirror images. Okay, so the word that we use to describe these is diastereomers. Is non superimposable non mirror images, but they're still stereoisomers of each other, they still have the same connectivity. So the easiest way to check this is just go stereo center by stereo center. Um, and so long as the molecules are drawn in the same conformation, this is really easy. I just go one at a time. OK, the first one, carbon 2, as I'm moving over from the left. This one's dashed. This one's bold. So these stereo centers are flipped. This one's dashed, this one's bold, these stereo centers are flipped. So as long as the molecules are drawn in the same orientation, if I want them to be enantiomers, I have to flip everything dashed to bold or bold to dashed um, between the two molecules. Okay, so another way to say this is... If all asymmetric carbons are the same, so bold stays bold, dash stays dashed, etc., the molecules are identical. Um, if all are flipped to their opposite, so Bold becomes dashed as you're comparing the two molecules, and dashed becomes bold. Then they're enantiomers. They're mirror images because everything is flipped. Um, if you're comparing them and some flip but some stay the same, then they're diastereomers. Okay, so a word of caution here. Turns out there are a few exceptions if the molecules are meso, which we're going to cover in the next section. So I'm just throwing a warning in here so that once we've covered that, you'll know to go and check that.
or if there are stereocenters other than asymmetric carbons, which we'll also cover. Okay. So, um, one kind of way of describing this that makes it a lot easier for me to think about um, is sort of draw these in like a two by two grid. Gesundheit. <laughs> okay, so drawing these four molecules up again. Bold, bold, dash, dash. Dash bold and bold dash. Okay. So um, we know this one and this one are enantiomers. Everything flips dash to bold or bold to dashed. Those are enantiomers. These are enantiomers of each other. And every other pairing in this set is diastereomers. So those are diastereomers because if you compare them, one of the stereocenters stays the same, bold stays bold, but meanwhile dashed here changes to bold over there. So some are the same, some are different, they're diastereomers. And the same for this pairing, some flip, some stay the same. And the same for this one. And the same for this one. All right, so in every single set of um, I guess stereoisomers for a given structure, you're going to have most molecules, um, unless there's meso going on, which we'll cover in a second, most, me most molecules will have one enantiomer, like a single mirror image of themselves, and then like every other pairing will be like a diastereomer where some stuff stays the same and some stuff flips. Okay, so if I gave you like one of these molecules out of the four, say this bottom right one, and I said, is this molecule an enantiomer or a diastereomer? That would be a meaningless question to ask because both the descriptors I'm applying just compare the relationship between two molecules. They don't describe one of these in isolation. I would have to say, here's two molecules. Are these diastereomers or enantiomers to each other? Um, or I could give you like one molecule and say, how many enantiomers does it have? And obviously the answer is gonna be one because you can only make one mirror image of it. Um, okay, so I guess the analogy that I like here is siblings versus cousins. Maybe think of enantiomers as siblings and diastereomers as being a cousin. If I give you like maybe one kid from the family and say, is this a sibling or a cousin? You don't know because you're comparing the pairwise relationship that it has with someone else in the family. But if I say like, is this thing compared to this thing, is it a sibling or a cousin? you would say it's a cousin, I guess, a diastereomer. <laughs> okay, mixing metaphors there. But um, then I could also say, like, how many total siblings are there for? How many total cousins are there for? But unless you, like, dig into a single relationship between a pairing of molecules, then it's hard to specify exactly what you're talking about. Question? Yep, yeah, because sort of by virtue of the way it works out, you have to flip every single stereocenter for, to make the enantiomer. And so there's only one possible outcome of how that would look. Whereas with diastereomers, if some flip and some stay the same to make that happen, then you have a ton more leeway of like exactly how many changes you could make to the molecule. Uh-huh. Is there a way to determine what the difference is between how many are possible? Yep, so this, this two to the end thing is the total number of stereo set, stereoisomers. So um, say for this one, we have four total stereoisomers. Um, so maybe say I'm focusing on this guy. I know that in this family, there's four total kids, I guess four total stereoisomers. Isomers. Of which one of the four is the guy that I'm asking about, 
one of the four is its sibling, it's an antiomer, and then the remaining like four minus two must be diastereomers to it. So it's pretty much like you got a total of like some number that's given by that formula and then you just subtract out this molecule plus it's an antiomer and then whatever's left are all the cousins, the diastereomers. Okay, um, so questions about that so far? Okay, cool. Sorry, did I? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, so we can actually sort of put together a hierarchy of how related two molecules are to each other. <laughs> so we can say, If two things straight up have a different formula, like they have different parts that they're made up of, then they're straight up not related at all. Um, same formula, but different connectivity. What would I call that? Yeah, constitutional isomer. And then same formula and connectivity. But different shape, or in other words, non-superimposable. The general term for that is a stereoisomer, but then we can subdivide that even further. If it's a mirror image, it's an enantiomer. If it's not mirror image, It's a diastereomer. Okay, so we sort of have different levels of how related two molecules can be to each other. Okay. Um, so questions about this? Yeah. Um, you know what, I probably should have written these in the opposite order, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess like enantiomers are more similar to each other than diastereomers are. Um, we'll get into physical properties in just a second here, but yeah, it turns out that um, as far as similarity goes, diastereomers are less similar. Okay, um, so we can actually apply this to other stereoisomers that we've seen already, such as alkenes. So cis-trans stereoisomerism like this. So same formula, same connectivity, but they're not superimposable, they're different shapes. And they're also not mirror images of each other. So how would we classify these two molecules to each other? Yep, they're diastereomers. I heard a couple of people say it. So technically, any type of EZ or alkene isomerism counts as a diastereomer. Just, it's not like the normal type of diastereomerism um, that we would see on like asymmetric carbons, but it does still sort of fall into that category by default because they're not mirror images of each other. Okay. Um, so questions about this. Um, one quick question that I think 
relates to one particular question on sapling. Um, and that is that for reasons that we'll cover in the next chapter, if you have a ring with an alkene in it, with um, less than eight carbons, um, turns out the geometry around the double bond only lets them be cis alkenes. So not a stereocenter. So I think there's one question in sapling where it says like, I want to say it's something like this. I don't remember exactly the details, but this is a fair thing to base this off of. And it's like put a star on every carbon that's a stereocenter. Um, the asymmetric carbon is kind of the first place to check. This one here, it's bold and dashed. That's looking very suspect. So checking, I've got an OH, an H, uh, one direction around the ring that looks different from the other direction around the ring. So that's a stereocenter. Swapping two groups there would turn it into a different molecule. Um, also on this alkene, this has cis-trans isomerism. So right now it's trans, but if I turned it to cis, it would also be a different molecule. So both carbons of that alkene also count as stereocenters. So easy or cis-trans is possible here. But because the ring has less than eight carbons, this alkene does not have the same thing going on. It cannot be trans. Which means that that's not a stereocenter, or neither of the carbons are stereocenters. Okay, so I think this came up as an issue last year, which is why I inserted this little side note this year. I think it was on sapling. It might have been in a recitation quiz. I don't remember which, but um, we'll get to why that is when we start covering cyclic compounds next chapter. It's just to do with, like, you straight up don't have room for a transalkene in a ring that small. Okay, um, so questions about that? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, right, so just because um, this one has the freedom to be either cis or trans, so both carbons of the alkene suddenly become stereocenters that way. Because I guess if you think of it like stereocenter is any place where swapping two groups gives you a different molecule. And if I swapped, say, like this methyl and this H, suddenly it goes to the other form. And the same thing here. If I swap them, it goes to the other form. But I can't do that here. There's only one form of it possible. Yeah, so it's just kind of like this weird quirk where it almost is a stereocenter, but it just turns out like one option is not an op is not even physically possible, and so then the whole thing gets like ruled out as a stereocenter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I get you first, and then I'll come down to you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you do when you're assigning R and S. Like, so if I were going out from this carbon, I'd say, okay, this one has a single bond to another carbon. This one has two bonds to carbon. But that's for just determining, like, what configuration I got going on here. And then later on, when I'm looking at this alkene and I'm trying to figure out, like, are these stereocenters, are these stereocenters, then I just sort of evaluate it as, like, a cis-trans alkene in its own right. So I'm sort oh, sorry. Uh, these ones, um, so they're not asymmetric carbons, but they are still stereocenters. So that's kind of, um, so asymmetric carbons are like a really common subset of stereocenters, but another common subset is cis-trans alkenes, and then there are other ones that we'll cover right at the end of this chapter, like weird ones that don't fit in either category. So, uh -huh. And then, sorry, you had a question too? So carbon wants the alkene to Good catch, yeah, it totally is. Yep, whoops. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
Um, so other questions about this one? Yeah. Uh, for this top one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I got uh, OH bold, which means I have to have H dashed coming off there for this to be tetrahedral. Um, assigning priorities, let me get both hands free. Um, so I go out one step at a time from the stereo center, and I'm seeing oxygen versus hydrogen versus carbon versus carbon. Right away, I know that oxygen has won first place. Hydrogen has come in last for priority, and then it's down to a race between carbon and carbon, this carbon has two bonds to other carbons as I move out. This one just has one bond to another carbon as I move out. So this side wins second place and third place. And so now if I'm looking at it, okay, group four is in the back. Now I can go one to two to three. I'm going counterclockwise, so this is S here. Okay, so, mm-hmm. Um, both single bonded. Uh, so in that case, I'd go like, okay, looks the same here. It's a CH2 with a bond to the next carbon along. Um, then I'd get down to here and I'd say, okay, this thing has two total bonds to carbon as I move outwards. This one just has the one. So in that case, this right side of the ring would win out. So then like my two and three would be flipped and then it would turn out to be R instead of S. So, okay, in the back there. Mm -hmm. Actually, one second, guys. Could you keep it down? Sorry, I'm having a hard time uh, hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, what about single between two bonds bonds by the top? Uh, this one here? Oh, uh, cyclo. Oh, sorry, that's not a C. That's a, a less than sign. Uh, small cycloalkene, uh, cycloalkenes with less than eight carbons can only be cis. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, sorry, that's my handwriting. <laughs> Okay, um, so other questions about this example? Okay, cool. All right. So, um, I mentioned what's called meso compounds or meso, depending on who you ask. Um, and we're going to look at those next. Okay, so again, I'm going to draw up one set of connectivity or one sort of connectivity with no stereochem shown. And then I'm going to show all the possible ways that that could be drawn as a stereoisomer. So again, okay, so again, I can do bold, bold. But I can do bold dashed, I can do dashed bold, and I can do dashed dashed. So again, you're looking at this and you might think, okay, so this molecule has four different possible stereoisomers. Um, same as the last example, pretty much. But you would be wrong. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the thing about one of these is that I guess what you want to think about visually for this rotation, I always think about like this molecule is flat in the plane of the board, more or less, with its OH just kind of sticking out and back. Um, I always visualize like scooping a spatula up along the board and flipping it over kind of like that. And if you do that, both of its OHs flip from going away from you to popping out towards you, which means suddenly if I flip the molecule over, it looks exactly the same as this one. That was not a possibility for that former set of four, because if I did that, it would be obvious I'd flipped it, because the tail, like the, the alkyl end of the molecule would be pointing the wrong direction, and it wouldn't be drawn out the same anymore. But in this case, I can actually convert one of these molecules to where it looks exactly the same as the other, and all I'm doing is just rotating it in space, so I haven't actually flipped any stereo centers. So it turns out these two are not enantiomers like you might initially guess. Um, you might think like bold flips to dashed and bold flips to dashed. Every stereocenter flips, they're the same. But if you can do some rotation that actually gets them to look identical to each other, they're not enantiomers, they're identical.
Um, these two, though, in the middle, you can't actually do that. If I scooped this up and flipped it over, um, this bold one would sort of rotate around and end up pointing away from me. So it would be just taking the place of this dashed one. This dashed one would sort of be swinging around and ending up sort of pointing out of the board. So it would rotate into this bold one. And you would never get it to rotate to where it looks the same as this. So these two are still in antiomers. But these two at the ends have something weird going on. Um, you may have actually been tipped off that that might have something weird going on with these two molecules. Because if you remember, um, when we were looking at enantiomers, the whole point was that they're not superimposable mirror images, and they're both chiral, which means that they had an internal mirror plane of, uh, they had no internal mirror plane of symmetry. But these two guys, if you check for it real quick, you find that they're not even chiral molecules. Like they have an internal mirror plane of symmetry. And so it's impossible for them to have a non-superimposable mirror images. So they're not even chiral. OK. So um, I'm going to take a minute and erase the other half of the board if you guys want to take a quick break. Okay, so what we're looking at for these two molecules, which are really, okay guys? All right, so what we're looking at here for these two molecules that are not actually two molecules at all, they're just two pictures of the same molecule, are meso molecules. So the official definition for MISO is an achiral molecule that has chiral diastereomers. And I didn't move the camera. Wait, yes I did. Okay. Okay. So in other words, um, if I change some of the stereocenters but not others, so like this thing is achiral and meso. And if I change that to, say, bold dashed, this is chiral. And the relationship between these two, given that some stereocenters are flipped and some are not, these must be diastereomers. 
All right, so it's miso, but if you put it together just a little bit differently, um, it would end up being chiral if it were the diastereomer of how it is now. Okay, so um, how this affects the total number of stereoisomers for a molecule. Um, each miso form decreases the total number of stereoisomers by one. And when I say each miso form, like this one and this one are the same miso form, they're the same molecule. So that's dropping the total number of molecules here by one. So here, instead of two to the two or four, minus one gives me three total unique stereoisomers for this setup. Okay, so if I had something with a lot more stereocenters, it's possible to have multiple different miso forms. I'm going to draw this kind of weird just so it's easier to see the plane of symmetry. Okay, so say I have something with a bunch of like halogens hanging off it along the chain. Okay, so these two, is this one miso? Yep, given that it's got a plane of symmetry, each half reflects into the other half, it's miso. This one is also miso. But it's not the same as that form. These two are also diastereomers of each other. But then like every other possible setup for this molecule I could have drawn, like any other combination of bold and dashed. Say like do, 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 do. Maybe like bold, dashed, bold, bold, for example. This would be not miso, this would be chiral. And it's also a diastereomer to both those other two guys that I drew. Okay, so just off the bat using the two to the n rule, I would initially anticipate, so I got four stereocenters, I should have at maximum 16 different molecules, right? But I know I've got two different miso forms, which is cutting my total by one per miso form. So really, I'm going to have to subtract two from this, which means that if I draw them out for this connectivity, I should end up with only 14 stereoisomers. All right, so you may see in the exam archives, like, here's a connectivity of a molecule, draw every possible stereoisomer. If you're drawing one and you find out that there's a miso form in there, you better end up falling short of the two to the n rule. Question? If you had drawn the above examples, say, like, the first one, um, we are with both VR to the dash and both four and two to the whole, mm -hmm. is that a third? Ah, but then that's identical to this one, so it's just a second depiction of the same thing. So, like, what you're asking is, um, if I had drawn what initially looks like the enantiomer of this, 
this molecule. And this is why our total count drops by one, because drawing what looks like the enantiomer actually is the identical molecule. Again, if I pick this up, flip it over like a pancake, it ends up looking exactly the same as this. So it ends up not being a unique molecule at that point. Question in the back? Uh, yeah, or I could just do sort of what I did over here where I'm like, here's the connectivity, figure out all the different possible ways that bold and dash could be set up. Um, I think that's more common as an exam question, but yeah, I, I guess like if it were something we've covered the naming for, then I could do that. We haven't done the naming on alcohols at all, so that wouldn't be fair game though. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But that's actually a good segue into one more warning note on this front in like the last couple minutes that I have left. Be careful. Just because it's not drawn in a way that looks like there's a plane of symmetry doesn't mean you can't rotate it to a place where there is a plane of symmetry. So remember that single bonds are freely rotating. So like a real common sort of question for people to ask is, here's a molecule like this, is it chiral or not? Looking at this, you're like, yeah, I don't see any plane of symmetry. Sure, it's chiral. But, haha, <laughs> if I redraw this guy, I'm going to, let's see. Um, so I redrew it so that this right half stays sort of curving around like in a downward facing arc. So this part ends up staying the same. And then this whole half of the molecule flips upside down so that my OH is pointing upwards. And so bold OH there would have to flip to dashed OH when it's pointing upwards. If you're having a hard time seeing that, model kits are super helpful. Um, is this chiral? No, it is not. There is a mirror plane here. So watch out for bond rotation is kind of the, uh, the unfortunate caveat there. Mm -hmm. So question. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's uh, a chiral and miso. So that actually sort of touches on just a little bit of something that we're not going to dig into too much in lecture, but it does pop up a little bit in the one lab related to this, is how do we treat molecules where they're achiral some of the time, and then like you can draw them in a chiral shape the rest of the time? Turns out the rule is that if they can ever be achiral, like in any conformation, then they're never chiral because once they get to here, they're just as likely to rotate out of it in like one direction as they are in the other. So if they're sometimes achiral, like in one conformation, they're always, always achiral. So in other words, if one then the whole molecule counts as a chiral, no matter how it's drawn to start out with. OK, so um, I guess the way that you want to approach this if you're looking at like a test question is, all right, so there's no obvious plane of symmetry, no obvious way to cut this right now. But I'm really suspicious about this because connectivity-wise, it looks the same moving out from the middle. I start like in the middle of this bond. I got a carbon with an OH and a carbon and a methyl coming off of it. So connectivity looks kind of suspiciously symmetrical. Why don't I try twiddling around with the bond orientation and seeing if I can get it to somewhere where it actually looks like more of a plane of symmetry? Okay, I'm going to wrap it up there and then finish the last bit of the chapter on Friday. <laughs>